Terrific. Thank you so much, Varun, for that very nice introduction. And thank you to Yonat, Elizabeth and Varun for inviting me today. Um, so I'm going to talk about for about half an hour on um, the ADHD polygenic score. Um, so let's get my slides moving. There we go. So this is where we are normally based in uh, Mallet Street in um, near Torrington Square in, in Birkbeck in London. Um, contact me if you'd like to visit. We always like to have um, visitors from friendly fellow labs. And these are my current um, PhD postdocs and my co-director Emma Meeburn there as well. Um, and the outline for this half an hour, I thought I would go over a systematic review I worked on with, uh, together with my colleague Tinker Polderman on the ADHD polygenic score. And then I will discuss some newer work that's come out since that review on um, the ADHD polygenic score in infancy and some work I've been involved with with the baby twins um, study in, twin study in Sweden, BATS. Um, and then I'll discuss a little bit about application, so polygenic scores and what they might mean for medical practice and their strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. So um, I am very keen on uh, studying autism and have done quite a bit of autism research one way or another. And I know this is the autism research center that I'm speaking to. Um, so um, I know I'm not focusing on autism here, but I think you'll all be aware that ADHD is also an important neurodevelopmental condition and it co-occurs often with autism and it might have some similarities in terms of etiological pathways. So I'm hoping that my talk, even though it focuses on ADHD, will feel relevant and interesting to you all today. Um, so just so we're all reminded, uh, ADHD is a neurodevelopmental condition and it's defined in the DSM-5 here uh, with, uh, you must show at least six symptoms of inattention or hyperactivity and impulsivity, or both of those. And it typically onsets in early and mid childhood, although there is also an adult onset version. And symptoms um, in order to receive a diagnosis need to be interfering with academic, occupational and social, or social functioning. Um, but overall, I really recommend this nice paper from 2020 in The Lancet by Posner Polanx, I'm not sure how to pronounce the middle name, and Sonuga Bark, which gives a really brilliant overview of ADHD from a variety of angles. Um, so, the polygenic risk score, before I go on to that and why it's useful, and I would like to emphasize that if you're not a geneticist, um, but you are interested in ADHD or autism, try not to switch off at this point because I won't actually be talking that much about genetics and genes. I'm just gonna, first of all, describe about how we derive a polygenic score. And that's um, through conducting a genome-wide association study, which is where we look for signals associated with a condition or trait across the whole genome. And um, the interesting thing that was worked out by a variety of very smart statistical geneticists a few years ago was that if we include the variants in the genome that are not showing significant associations but are still showing some signal, as well as the significant variants, we get uh, the, the model outperforms um, the, the model that only includes the significant variants. So, by including everything, all the results, um, we get a stronger signal, as it were. And so it goes against the idea in the past or in, and, and what is often used in other fields of only looking at things that are significant according to a threshold. We actually add all the SNPs together into the model and that, that is how we create a polygenic score. Um, so just if, go, on, go on to that a bit further. What we do is once we've found our results, so looked at all these genes across the genome and their association with ADHD status, um, we then add them together for each individual and create a personal score for each individual based on whether or not that individual has each genetic variant um, that's associated with ADHD um, and weight that signal by how strongly it's associated with ADHD. So you have some very strongly weighted SNPs in there. These are, the, these are base pair differences, single nucleotide polymorphisms, but you also have uh, weaker signals and that all adds up to a polygenic score, which is a score each of us can have on in terms of um, the number of genes, genetic variants we have that increase our likelihood of developing ADHD. It's a relatively new approach um, back when I was doing a PhD about uh, 15 years ago, um, there were some ideas like, for example, Robert Plowman was working with the idea of developing a SNP set 
where he's adding together a snip effect of just a small number of snips. And here, um, and then it was really Sean Purcell who developed the idea of a, a whole polygenic score, adding up all the genetic effects from the whole genome-wide association study. Do I have a question in the chat? I'm just gonna look because. No, I've just sort of asked people to type questions in if they have any. Thank you. Um, so it's a relatively new method. And um, for that reason, there's also still a lot of change in how we, how we create polygenic scores. And I would recommend you uh, go to this paper if you are interested in looking at that variety, the variety of current methods. This is by Oliver Payne, who um, actually did a PhD in my lab and now works with Catherine Lewis and has done this very important work with Catherine. So I'm like very proud of his work and, and like, you know, push it, publicizing it wherever I can because he's an alumni of my lab, um, but it's also very good <laughs> as well. Um, here we go. So. In terms of ADHD, there was a powerful genome-wide association done, study done of ADHD published in 2019, and they had 20,000 ADHD cases and 35,000 controls, and they estimated a SNP heritability from that study of 22%. They found 12 independent loci, those are the ones that actually reached genome-wide significance, but they also created um, the polygenic score, and that's the thing I'm going to be focusing on today. Where, as I said, they don't just include the genome-wide significant SNPs, they include all the SNP um, variation across the genome with its respective uh, significance level. And this polygenic score explained 5.5% variance in ADHD, as reported in de Montes et al.'s paper. So um, this is what the polygenic risk score looked like in their paper where they have the uh, deciles. So these are different individuals on the x-axis, depending on how high they score on the polygenic score for ADHD. So how many SNP variants each individual has that increase their likelihood of ADHD. And then on the y-axis, you can see odds ratio for developing ADHD. And there's two different samples. Um, the blue is a, a, a European sample, iPsych, and then the red, I believe, is mostly American, the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium sample. And for both samples, you can see what we would call a dose-dependent relationship. So the more um, SNPs that uh, are associate with ADHD that the individual has, the higher their odds ratios of developing ADHD. Um, so it's not just literally none of us have any increased risk other than a small proportion who have lots of genes or anything like that. It seems to add sort of additive effect. The more genes you have influencing likelihood for ADHD, the more your um, likelihood of developing ADHD is. So um, before I go on, um, you might find you've reached the end of this talk and think she hasn't talked anything about the actual individual genes associated with ADHD. And in fact, I'm not going to, that's because um, I'm just focusing on the polygenic score today, which adds all the variants together. If you are curious, these are the 12 independent loci, and it, in this table shows you where the genes are and, and their allele frequencies and so on, and that's all available in the De Montes et al. paper. But I'm actually focusing on the polygenic score today and what we can do with it. And, um, and, and this is really actually where the sort of molecular genetics ends, really, because after this, we're going to be talking about studies that use regression and use the polygenic score just like a predictor in a regression model, um, just like we might do in epidemiology or psychology or lots of other fields. So, um, as I said, what we have is this polygenic score. Um, so here is a nice representation of that, where you've got lots of alleles and on average cases with ADHD are likely to have more of the risk alleles, um, not risk alleles, sorry, the alleles associated with ADHD than controls. And then we can calculate that score in any sample that is genotyped. Um, so it doesn't, we don't need to have individuals with ADHD. They can be any age, they can be infants, they can be um, you know, people in their 90s. As long as they're genotyped, we can then calculate the polygenic score in a new sample and test the association between the ADHD polygenic score and any outcome variable, any variable we're interested in will be the outcome variable. So does the polygenic risk score for ADHD predict individual differences in whatever outcome measure we're interested in? And um, Tinker Polderman and Nora de Bode and I um, felt interested enough to do a systematic review of the ADHD polygenic score literature, um, which was just published at the end of last year. So uh, what we did is we searched the 
literature for all studies that have used the ADHD polygenic score to look at, is it working? Does it reliably predict um, phenotypes? If so, what does it predict? And uh, what are the sort of effect sizes we see? So we used the um, PRISMA guidelines and registered the systematic review on um, Prospero. In this circumstance, we decided not to meta-analyze. There was quite a lot of heterogeneity and variability in the data and samples. Um, possibly we could go back um, once the literature becomes a bit larger and maybe a bit more systematic and um, do some meta-analysis. But for this, we did a systematic review, which we still felt was pretty informative for showing where the field was going in terms of using the ADHD polygenic score and, and whether it was valid or not. So we did these searches in 2020. And uh, the inclusion criteria were that the polygenic score needed to come from this de Montes et al genome wide association study because this was by far the largest, most reliable genome wide association study of ADHD. And then the ADHD polygenic score needed to be used as a predictor to predict some other variable. And um, through screening this literature, we this is the standard PRISMA flowchart. Um, which is meant to be used, we found 44 studies that had used the ADHD polygenic score um, in their research. And now I thought I'd just take you through what the literature is kind of showing. We also did a quality assessment, which is a nice way of assessing the quality, basically, of the literature identifying, because that also gives the reader a handle on, you know, to what degree they should take these results seriously and, and so on. And these were the criteria we used. Um, and uh, what we actually found is that there was generally very high rate um, of excellent quality according to our criteria in the literature. And um, I can go back and talk about those criteria if um, people like later, but I thought I'd um, move on to the results so make sure I don't run out of time. Um, and what we found is first of all, there were 44 studies and these were the kinds of outcomes that people were looking at. To what degree did the ADHD polygenic score predict these different types of outcomes. And the larger the circle I've used just to reflect that there were more studies on these particular phenotypes. So you can see there were most studies on ADHD traits. So that's symptoms and traits measured dimensionally. And then quite a few studies on predicting clinical ADHD. And then also quite a few studies studying outcomes within mental health, um, brain-based uh, measurements like um, gray matter volume, educational outcomes and so on. And um, we categorized the domains using the International Statistical Classification of Diseases and the International Classification of Functioning, Disability and Health to some degree. But because there were some studies that had done a lot on, on specific areas and others for which we needed to use quite a general grouping, for example, you can see physical health is all grouped together, which is obviously a very broad grouping, but there weren't that many studies. So that's what we use. So we, we took, um, took things into our own hands a bit in order to make it kind of work. And then there were these um, uncategorized phenotypes, which were just a range of studies where there was only really one study on a particular topic. So we couldn't start to group them together. Um, so for example, I'll highlight their infant neuromotor functioning. So that was the only study that had looked at anything in infancy in terms of the ADHD polygenic score at that point. And I'll come back to that point later on. Um, just, just for shorthand, um, or, this is autism and autistic traits. It just looked a bit messy if I put those both in there. Um, so what did they find? Um, first of all, just to give you a sense of where this literature is coming from, there was a mix of um, population-based samples and clinical samples, and quite a few um, larger number of child studies than adult, and then some that had child and adult. And then a heavy... Uh, bias towards European and North American samples um, with just uh, four studies which had a mix of continents, one from Asia and one that didn't say. Um, and then a few samples that were used quite a few times. So There's quite a bit of repetition. Um, for example, Ausback, Imogen, Ad Health, and CATS had all been used three or more times in different samples, in different studies of the ADHD polygenic score. Um, so what was found? Well, you can see here, if we look at the top, so this is a bar chart just showing for the number of studies, uh, whether they found that the ADHD polygenic score significantly predicted these outcomes. So blue is significant and orange is not significant. So you can see there were 10 studies that all found that the ADHD polygenic score significantly predicted clinical ADHD. And you think, well, we've got to think this is a variety of different samples 
different ages, different communities, etc. ADHD traits was also they're all significant. Um, and then addiction, which was a bit more mixed um, with some significant findings and some not. The autism results I found surprising. I was expecting that the ADHD polygenic risk score would predict autism based on what I know about um, other types of evidence for autism and ADHD sharing some etiological pathways. But in fact, um, there was a mix, there weren't that many studies and um, over half didn't find a significant association association between the ADHD polygenic score and autism. And then you can see here for the others, quite a lot of significant results, externalizing was consistently significant. Um, mental health was quite mixed. Uh, neuropsychological, physical and socioeconomic um, were all significant. And then in terms of the, oops, oh, sorry, there's the, um, the range of effect sizes. So as I say, we didn't meta-analyze these particular data but the odds ratios for the ADHD polygenic risk score predicting clinical ADHD were between 1.22 and 1.76. And then for the trait measures, they, the ADHD polygenic score was predicting between, you can see about one and 3% variance in ADHD traits. Um, and then in terms of the types and levels of evidence, so there was strong evidence as, as I've sort of already emphasized for the polygenic score associating with ADHD and ADHD traits. Um, but there's also associate measures, um, strong evidence that it was associating with brain-based phenotypes. So it was associated with lower um, brain, gray matter volume, for example, and lower educational outcomes um, or lower educational achievement, more externalizing behaviors, um, poorer working memory and higher BMI later on. And then there was less conclusive evidence, as you sort of saw from those blue and orange graphs, but just to clarify here, with addiction, autism and autism and autistic traits outcomes and mental health outcomes. And that's just the detail from the study of how we categorized these strong and inconclusive levels of evidence. Um, so um, to zoom in on a few sort of details about the findings that I thought were really interesting and I thought may interest you as well. Um, this is a bit of a texty slide, but within ADHD, as I've said, it predicted both ADHD and ADHD traits, but there was also some evidence that it, the ADHD polygenic score predicted hyperactivity more accurately than inattentiveness, um, which I thought was interesting and, and could do with some more follow-up. And it also seemed to, in a nice study by Joel Nigg, it predicted emotional dysregulation um, subtype of ADHD more so than an irritability subtype. So there's some work to try and look at the nosology of ADHD through using the polygenic score. And then outside of ADHD, there was little or no link between the ADHD polygenic score and autism and schizophrenia, both of which I was quite surprised by based on other, other forms of evidence I know about. And there was generally smaller effect sizes when, when studies were trying to look outside of ADHD, which is supportive of the validity of the polygenic score because it should be predicting ADHD more strongly than other phenotypes. And then interestingly, in a range of studies, um, it was always predicting early onset of other conditions, which I, I thought was, as a developmental psychologist, I found interesting. So it predicted early onset of bipolar disorder within bipolar disorder cases it predicted the earliest onset group for cognitive decline within schizophrenia and within depression trajectories in teenagers. Again, it predicted the earliest onset group and not these later onset groups. So I thought that was very interesting from a kind of developmental standpoint. Um, now, um, for those of you who are perhaps more interested in environment or feel that we should study genes and environment very much together. Um, I completely agree. And actually what I feel we're getting from polygenic score work is a, a greater understanding of environmental effects as well and of gene environment correlation effects together. So um, what a few studies showed is that the polygenic score actually predicted a range of what we might consider environments. So it predicted lower socioeconomic status and a range of types of adversity. Um, which I thought was um, very fascinating. And in work that's relatively complex to think about, I find and explain by Seltzer and colleagues, but it's, I think, very valuable. They find that the polygenic score for ADHD predicts educational outcomes more strongly 
within sibling associations um, than between sibling associations. Oh, I think I've got my um, I've got my arrow the wrong way around. So my apologies there. So um, no, sorry. Uh, yes, that's right. So. Um, it would look like the polygenic score to some degree um, is confounded with some family environmental factors, because otherwise the association should be the same, whether you're looking at within siblings or between siblings. And um, another quite fascinating um, development, I think, if you're maybe a neuroscientist here and thinking, I'm not really into genetics, I'm more into studying the brain, is that in my experience, it's been quite hard to link genes to brain to behavior in, in, in the efforts I've seen so far. Um, but quite a few studies um, were having some success in, in linking the ADHD polygenic score to, as we've heard earlier on in my slides, um, things like total brain volume, various metrics of um, uh, the brain function structure. And um, there were also some quite interesting mediation analyses. And this all comes, also comes from Joel, Joel Nigg's group. Um, where the ADHD polygenic score was predicting ADHD, associating with ADHD diagnosis, and this was moderated by um, an association with brain volume. <clears throat> so my conclusions, our conclusions from this systematic review is that quite a wealth of high quality results had emerged using the ADHD polygenic score, and it is reliable and robust as far as we can see from the literature to date. Um, and it associates with the type of phenotypes we know phenotypically associated with ADHD. So it's not like the results from the genetics are completely um, uh, giving a different picture to what we know phenotypically about ADHD and the types of conditions it co-occurs with, with perhaps one exception of the autism results, which perhaps are too, you know, just need um, some more studies, but that, that's something to discuss definitely. And um, you saw those effect sizes there. They would not be large enough effect sizes to use for any sort of individual prediction. So we could all find out our ADHD polygenic score. We could find out our children's or our newborn baby's ADHD polygenic score. We, not, we will not be able to use that with any accuracy to predict whether our child will have ADHD because the effect sizes are, are they're significant, but they're, they're, they're much too small for that. Um, it seems to me to be a valid um, polygenic score because of its consistent association so far and the fact that it associates with ADHD more than non-ADHD phenotypes. Um, the results are in line with other types of uh, fields of research and um, it shows specificity. Um, I now, so that was by far the longest section, so don't worry, I'm not, I might run over by a few minutes if that's all right, Baron, um, because I think I'd timed it for about half an hour. No problem. Is that okay? Yeah, um, no problem at all. Uh, okay, it would, be, it would be nice to talk about the other parts. So, um, as I mentioned, I'm a co-I with Professor Taria Falkjata, who's the PI on this baby twin study Sweden, um, where we've used um, multimodal assessments on 600 infants um, at age five months and then followed them up and so we are doing some work that's just starting to come out oh that's mainly the assessment so I'll go over that and we are using um, polygenic scores to, to look at whether they predict neurocognitive function and behavior in infancy um, and we obviously this has been planned for quite some time but as you saw from the literature to date uh, kind of surprisingly, infancy hasn't really been studied that much yet with the ADHD polygenic score, at least not at the point that we finished our search. There have been a few more studies since our search ended. Um, and it would be really gratifying to see more work on this area because I think it'd be very useful to know um, the kind of um, associations that exist between the ADHD polygenic score and infant development um, in order to try to understand the neurodevelopmental pathways underlying ADHD. In this study, we didn't actually find an association between the ADHD polygenic score and our phenotype. So we were studying um, a type of sensory reactivity, the pupillary light reflex. And you can see we didn't find an association. Yes, I really just wanted to highlight that um, there'll probably be there's sort of more work coming from the BAT study um, using polygenic scores to look at infant neurocognitive development. But I know as you guys wanted to put this on YouTube, I was focusing on published work today. So that's really it. Um, and then to highlight that 
the work we have underway at the moment is funded by the Simons Foundation and we are looking at um, a large genome-wide association study of infant motor development. So we're hoping to um, sort of add to the picture in terms of understanding the early pathways to neurodevelopmental conditions like ADHD um, through developing summary statistics of infant um, motor development and temperament traits. Um, and these are the my team who are working on it, Dr. Anna Gui and Anya Hollowell. Um, so uh, the two final sections, which are the most short, but I think important to talk about. Um, I think sometimes polygenic scores seem really peculiar and we sort of think, what are we doing? And, and they can cause concern. Um, and I find it reassuring in some ways or helpful maybe to think about some parallels in existing medical practice. So first of all, the APGAR score is something your a baby gets when it's born um, about their, their risk of needing support. And it, in a way, the, the doctors to get the APGAR score, they add together the um, signs from a variety of different um, factors that are, are, are in terms of the appearance and, and so on of the physiology of the newborn baby. And so it's not really mechanistically driven in the sense of you're adding together a variety of different um, fa mechanistic factors, but it's still helpful. And so there's sort of a similarity with the polygenic score in the sense of we're adding together variants across the genome that do very different things, but we're still trying to get a sense of, of likelihood and of, of um, associations with other outcomes. Secondly, um, the family history, our family history of conditions is, is quite similar to polygenic scores and it, it gives us a sense individually of whether we're likely to have a condition. Um, the polygenic score is, is in a way better because it's in, uh, specific to your, the individual rather than to a family. So my older brother and I both share a family history. He happens to be a foot taller than me. So our, we both have the same family history, but it's not explaining our, our, our difference in height, for example, whereas a polygenic score um, would, would, would explain that difference as well. And I'd, I'd, I've, I found this uh, new height genome-wide association study that just came out, I think last week, on 5 million people and um, very informative. So they show that um, your average parental height predicts your height um, with about 40% predictive accuracy. But when they added their new polygenic score to that, then the accuracy went up to 54%. So um, there, are, it's, it, there is different information between the polygenic score and family history, but there's also similarities in terms of thinking about how polygenic score sits. Um, so had I got to the point, well, I'll, I'll just say it again, I'm sorry if it's a repeat, that um, this new polygenic score for height, which is one of the largest genome-wide association studies to ever been conducted, which is 5 million people, um, the polygenic score for height offers additional information above and beyond knowing your, the average of your parent's height in terms of predictive accuracy. So polygenic scores do add something in addition to family history. Um, and add to the predictiveness and are better for predicting your individual outcome rather than at a family-wide level. And finally, in terms of parallels with existing medical practice, we do currently have a very high uptake. Uh, most parents agree for their newborn baby to have the heel prick test where a sample of blood is taken um, around five days old. And this helps to um, identify very rare conditions um, early on and, and help a lot of children. Um, so I, th I thought I'd flag that. Um, but at the same time, there are different challenges to polygenic scores and, for example, the newborn um, heel prick test. And I just made this comparison uh, for my own interest, really, between a, a, one of the best polygenic scores, which is for BMI by Kara et al, and the cystic fibrosis um, detection in the newborn heel prick test. Um, and you can see that this ha still has much, much higher sensitivity to the polygenic score. They both have very low positive predictive values, but because cystic fibrosis is so rare, this doesn't cause a very big issue in terms of the screening program um, for identifying children to help them early on. Whereas this really would help, um, wouldn't be uh, effective for a common condition to try and um, bring help to children early on. So this is a sort of complicated way for me to say um, there are big issues with um, 
individual likelihood early on at this point because of their low sensitivity and positive predictive value. Um, and I'll just do the final slides, um, which um, I wrote in also for JCPP um, and uh, uh, some thoughts about the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats of polygenic scores. And um, I think they're very valuable in the way that they they give a sense of an individual's overall genetic load. And I think we can see from the literature I reviewed on ADHD, the value they can bring to analyses. Um, the, the scores are always relative to the whole population and they are a simplified biological summation, which is a strength, but you know, in other ways it's a weakness. And I think they're also helping us to understand nurture, as I tried to emphasize um, earlier on with the gene environment correlation literature. Um, heterogeneity and we saw it you know could also be considered a weakness that they are inflated by gene environment correlation there's an influx of methods which is great but for a literature at this point you are sometimes feeling like you're comparing apples with pears or at least different types of apples when you've got studies that have used different methods to calculate their polygenic scores and there's a huge imbalance at the moment in terms of polygenic scores across ancestries, which um, I know many fit groups are working to address, um, and but it's important to highlight. Um, there's a real opportunity that I think we've seen here for cross sample associations, which is very difficult. You know, we can associate something that's measured in infancy with something that's measured in over 90 year olds in a way that one could have never done before because you would need to have had the measure in the same sample and that would have therefore been a 90 year long study. So the ability to flexibly look at associations across samples is really incredible. And there are really good methods developments happening. In theory, um, early identification to help enable early support will be possible in the long run um, with um, using polygenic scores in combination with many other factors such as family history and knowledge about environments and um, other distal and, and distal factors. And um, I think they present an opportunity for public engagement as well. But there are threats in terms of um, sort of um, misguided hype about polygenic schools, which I think can happen, and miscommunication about what they are and what they'll mean. And one also worries about iatrogenic effects, which is just the process of knowing and, and going through a kind of medical um, setting or finding out some knowledge in itself makes people um, ha have um, unwanted um, symptoms and, and, and issues. And um, there's obviously a concern about unlawful and unethical application, which we all need to think about in our research um, in this area. Um, so just to acknowledge my collaborators and my lab group and my funding, um, and thank you to all the participants and the cohort teams that I'm involved with. And thank you so much for listening.